it is 12.01, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to today's CryoEM Current Practices webinar. Uh, you're joining the three national centers established by the NIH Common Fund Transformative High Resolution Cryoelectron Microscopy Program, the National Center for CryoEM Access and Training, NCCAT, the Pacific Northwest CryoEM Center, PNCC, and the Stanford Slack CryoEM Center, S2C2. Uh, my name is Christina Zamani. I am a scientist and training liaison at NCCAT, and um, today I'm also your webinar moderator. The CryoEM Current Practices uh, webinar is an ongoing series that we host the last Thursday of every month at this same time, and our speakers highlight the methods they're using to obtain and interpret the data they can collect on the high-end instrumentation available at the national centers. And our hope is that these talks share uh, practical details of the methods that will make CryoEM more accessible to the broader biomedical research community. Um, for that reason, we aim to leave enough time for Q&A at the end of the talk so that you can ask the questions um, about the details that are most useful to you. Uh, we are recording today's talk, and uh, you can find it on our YouTube page along with all of our previous talks. Um, so we have a short link, tinyurl.com slash cryoem talks to get to our YouTube page, or you can find the recordings um, via this uh, shared website, cryoemcenters.org. Um, that center will also have res uh, uh, registration links for future talks, including our talk on May 27th um, from Nicolas Corduroy at NYU School of Medicine on uh, E. coli lipid transporters. Um, so the registration link for that talk is already live, and I just wanted to show real quick that website. Um, so if you if you navigate to cryoemcenters.org, you can find the events tab, um, and under talks and symposia, we have information about coming talks, and you can register, and you can also find information about our um, past talks. Um, along with um, that information, you can find out information from the three cryoem centers here today, as well as the newly established uh, electron tomography centers and um, our uh, curriculum development teams who um, are developing fantastic training materials uh, for cryoEM. Uh, but back to our agenda today. Um, we have representatives from each of the three centers here who will give a quick, quick introduction and update from their centers. Uh, with us today are Jeanette Myers, a scientific point of contact at PNCC. Uh, Michael Schmidt, one of the principal investigators at S2C2, and Ed Eng, the manager at NCCAT. And after they give their updates, I will properly introduce today's speaker, Rahul Jaiswal, who's uh, joining us today from Virginia Commonwealth University of School of Medicine. Uh, also here today on the panel is Lauren Hales Beck, the project coordinator at PNCC, um, and she'll also be helping um, field questions about using national centers. Um, and a couple of uh, final logistics for your questions, please use the Q&A function you see at the bottom of your screen, um, not the chat. Um, you won't be able to turn on your microphone, so please ask your questions using that Q&A feature. Uh, feel free to send questions at any point. If they're directed to logistics or access at the centers, our panelists will uh, respond to them directly in that Q&A box. And we will save questions for Raul uh, for the end of his talk, um, but you'll be able to see questions other people are asking. So if you've got a question and you notice someone else already asked it, um, go ahead and upvote that. That will help us prioritize our discussion at the end of the talk. Um, with that, I will turn over to our center representatives and um, Jeanette, you get to go first. Sure thing. Hey, so uh, my name is Jeanette Myers, obviously. Um, I, I'm a Spock from the Pacific Northwest Cryoem Center, and I'm just going to tell you real quick what resources uh, PNCC can offer you. So PNCC has one proposal type for all of our projects, which will award up to 480 hours a year and is valid for up to two years. Applications are due every month on the 1st at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time, and you can apply using the PNCC user portal. You can see that on the screen. Uh, generally, it takes about 40 days from the due date for proposals to be reviewed and to receive an award letter. And once approved, we recommend that you attend our uh, user onboarding with Lauren. Um, and so PNCC has five microscopes, one Arctica and four Creos. 
We have one Creos with a Falcon 3 and a K3 with no energy filter. We have two Creos with a Falcon 3 and a BioQuantum K3. And then one of our Creos has a Falcon 3 and a BioContinuum K3. Uh, we will be outfitting one of our Creos with a Falcon 4 and a cold fig. And all of our Creos will be updated with green tree imaging by the end of 2021. Uh, we offer both screening and data collection for single particle and tomography on approved proposals. And additionally, each approved proposal will be delegated a scientific point of contact or SPOC, like myself, uh, who you can ask scientific questions. So for example, I've helped users with grid optimization and data processing questions. And we also have resources for sample preparation. So we have a VitraBot and a Leica GP2. And we are also currently, like right now, installing a VitraJet, which is really exciting. And uh, that should be ready to go soon. So if you're interested in using the VitraJet, uh, please keep an eye out for an announcement from us on how you can access that. And just the last thing I'll mention is that we are currently still under COVID restrictions. So we're offering remote one-on-one -on -one training and small remote workshops. But once we can have visitors on site again, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we do plan to offer small in-person workshops covering microscope operation and sample preparation. So thanks for listening and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank you, Jeanette. And we'll turn it over to, uh, to Mike. Thank you, Christina. I'm Mike Schmidt and I'm one of the co-directors of the uh, S2C2 Stanford Slack Cryogen Center along with um, Wachu and Britt Hedman. Uh, our center has uh, three uh, dedicated cry Krios microscopes uh, with access to another Krios and a target Talos Arctica for training. We have uh, all the details of, of their equipment is on the um, is is on our website. Uh, but we have K3 and uh, Falcon 4 cameras and energy filters also. Uh, so visit our website for all of the details of of what our of what our uh, uh, center has. And uh, I'd like to highlight too that the fact that we are currently starting to have more um, relaxed training uh, opportunities. Uh, in the last three months, I believe we have uh, successfully um, trained a, two users to completely uh, be independent on our microscopes. We have eight users who are now uh, in the process of training anywhere from 30% to 60%, 80% uh, fully trained. And we've uh, now gotten our next batch of eight trainees, which will be coming on to the next training session. So we're ramping up our training um, as, as the other centers are able to also. Mostly they're local now, of course, because uh, local California uh, travel is, is a little bit easier on the, uh, uh, for the restrictions. But we hope to open it to uh, users from a wider area soon. Please see our website and, um, and, and thank, you for, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, Mike. And now I will turn over to Ed. Hi, my name is Ed from NCCAT. We have two main types of access. One is instrumentation access on one of our four dedicated Creos instruments or Glacios or uh, chameleon blot-free vitrification. Our cross-training access is now still in a remote format, something that we have started up that was very successful last year, uh, our roundtable discussion. So every other week, uh, we have roundtables where we have small gatherings where we can talk about particular subjects related to CrowEM. Uh, so last week was on sample prep and uh, the next one coming up is on data collection. If you want to find out more on how to access NCCAT and these roundtables, you can go to ncat.nyspc.org or email nccattraining at nyspc.org. And thank you. Thank you, Ed. I'm going to stop sharing now so that I can introduce today's speaker. Um, and Raul, if you want to start getting your slide shared while I introduce you. Um, Raul Jaiswal has a broad background as a structural biologist. He completed his PhD work at the University of Florence, uh, where his research focused on structure-based drug design of matrix metalloproteases. Uh, he then did postdoctoral research at Virginia Commonwealth University and also at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, uh, where he used multiple biophysical and structural techniques, including X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM, to study proteins in multiple biological pathways, um, including eukaryotic repl replication, protein translation, and nucleosomal DNA regulation. 
since uh, 2018, he has been a research instructor, sorry, research instructor in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics at Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine. And uh, today we'll be hearing about some of the work uh, he's doing there, specifically uh, cryo-EM studies of a malleable oligomeric SF3 helicase. And um, when Raul's not in the lab working on complex biomolecules, you might find him outdoors hiking or trekking, uh, snapping pictures of the local wildlife or out on the soccer field. Um, so Raul, thank you very much for joining us here today. And the floor is all yours. Thanks, Christina, for the nice introduction. And thank you for inviting me to share our work. So today I'm going to talk about uh, our recent work on AV, uh, AAV rap proteins uh, in general, and with more uh, focused on uh, RAP68 and its functionality and oligomerization. So just to start with a little background about AAV. Uh, AV or adeno-associated viruses, they are simple eukaryotic virus, uh, belongs to parvovirus family and have single standard DNA as genetic material. They have single copy genome of around five KB size. One important aspect is there are no illness associated with, them, uh, with it. They are non-pathogenic. Uh, and there are 11 serotypes of this virus, which has diverse specific tissue specificity like uh, AV2 uh, is specific for kidney, uh, AV4, 5, 6 for lungs, uh, AV7, 8, 9 for liver, and so on. Uh, it induces very low immune response, uh, and uh, this is the only eukaryotic virus that can integrate uh, site specifically. So why uh, AAVs? Because in recent years, uh, emerge as the first uh, viral vector for gene therapy as uh, in uh, 2012, a European Medicine Agency. And in 2017, FDA approves uh, the AV-based uh, gene, gene therapy. A uh, little bit uh, about AV life cycles. AV, uh, are recognized by uh, glycosylated cell surface receptor. And uh, then they is, uh, that triggers a clathrin uh, internalization. And then they traffic through the cytosol. And once they reach to the nucleus, they're uncoating. And then there, are, there can be two different pathways, one uh, for uh, replication. So in one case, the single standard AV uh, sense or anti-sense strength, they go for replication. And uh, in another pathway, there is self-complementary AAV, uh, which doesn't use the host, uh, which uh, start replication. And depending on the intra or inter um, uh, molecular recombination of ITR, it can go to circular monomer or dimer or higher uh, multimers. And uh, rare events of integration into host genome also take place. And as I said, AV are uh, AV is where site specific integration to the host, and in human, it's human chromosome 19 where there is an integration site. So, <clears throat> AV, excuse me. So, AV use uh, three promoters for the expression of viral. Uh, viral genes and uh, P5 and P19 specifically uh, specifically uh, promotes a rap, a rap open reading frame, which in turns uh, which in turns uh, leads to uh, synthesis of rap four different rap proteins rap 78 68 52 and 40. P5 is responsible for larger wraps, and P19 is responsible for uh, smaller wraps. Uh, P40 is responsible for uh, synthesis of cap proteins, uh, and there are 
three different capsid protein, VP1, VP2, VP3. And then there is uh, the uh, app protein, which is the uh, assembly associated uh, protein. And the unique feature about AV is AV genome is the presence of this uh, inverted terminal repeats at the at the seater at the both the termini, and this uh, is about 145 base pair uh, hairpin like structure, which contains the sites for uh, which contains the DNA binding sites like RVS, which is wrap binding site. Uh, terminal resolution site and then the RBE element, the red binding elements. So AV replication and, and sorry. So uh, rep proteins, they are responsible for the uh, for the replication of uh, the single stranded DNA. And at the same time, they are responsible for the terminals, terminal resolution also. And hence the, and they are involved in multiple DNA transactions like genome replication, gene regulation, site-specific integration, and genome packaging. So, uh, wrap proteins, they are multi, they have two different multifunctional domains, uh, the N terminal origin binding domain and the C terminal helicase domain. Uh, so as I said, there are four different wraps, the large wrap 78 and 68 and small wraps 52 and 42, uh, for wrap 40. So wrap 78 and wrap 68, they share N terminal origin binding domain uh, and the helicase domain, C-terminal helicase domain, which is again a triple A helicase and uh, oligomerization domain. RAP78 as a uh, C-terminal zinc finger domain, and uh, so does RAP52. And RAP40 is the simplest SF3 helicase, uh, which lakes uh, zinc finger as well as OBD. So uh, OBD is responsible for the uh, specific DNA binding. And as you can see here, uh, the, uh, the col color red is responsible for binding to RBS. Uh, color pink is responsible for uh, binding the, uh, the TRS site. And purple is for the single strand uh, in the SS uh, binding. Uh, Loop. On the other hand, uh, uh, one uh, colored in light blue, that's oligomerization domain. And uh, then uh, this part is the P loop uh, helicase uh, and uh, the pre sensor uh, one beta helicase, and green uh, is beta helicase two. And uh, the helicase domain is involved in more non-specific DNA binding with the multiple DNA interacting interface. So AVs, uh, AV proteins are unique SF3 helicase, uh, though they belong to the SF3 uh, family, but uh, they are kind of subfamily in SF3 helicase. So unlike the other SF3 members, uh, which is papillomavirus E1 and SV40 T large antigen, uh, RAP40, uh, we previously shown that exists as monomer in solution at different concentration. Means even at higher concentration, it uh, it is uh, monomer in solution, unlike uh, the other SF3, which are hexamer in solution. In presence of uh, ATP, RAF40 undergoes a transient dimerization. And on the, uh, in contrast, RAF68 at, uh, higher, at higher concentration, it is uh, present in wide varieties of oligomeric species, ranging from dimer to, uh, to oct octomer. And 
one important uh, property of RAPS proteins is their oligomerization property is modulated by the kind of DNA structure they are interacting because they interact with different uh, DNA substrate ranging from ITR, the AVS1 site in chromosome 9, uh, P5 promoter, TRS, or single-stranded DNA. So uh, we studied in past how this DNA structure uh, modulates the oligomerization property. And this was the, the first uh, this was in a negative strain uh, data, which was uh, or which was collected in NCAT in 2008, and it, it shows uh, the RAP68 in presence of single-stranded DNA. It forms a double optomeric ring. On the other hand, when it uh, interacts with a, a double-stranded DNA, which is from AVS site, it forms a haptomeric ring. So to understand and gain the insight of molecular mechanism of this oligomerization and multifunctionality of the RAP proteins, we uh, continue this work uh, and uh, how uh, with the different uh, DNA substrates. And we started with the single stranded DNA. And this work is mostly done by the former grad student Vishaka Shantosh. And we made, uh, we incubated the protein with uh, single stranded DNA, and uh, then we collected this data at an NCCAT. And as you can see, uh, this is uh, this. We got an average uh, atomic resolution of 4.6. Uh, and this cryo map shows that this uh, structure is like a double funnel shape uh, ring and uh, which can be divided into three different uh, ring structure. So the central one is well-defined uh, OBD ring flanked with two heli uh, helical domains, HD1 and HD2. Now HD2 has very weak density and it's fragmented and we're not able to fit any individual subunit. On the other hand, HD1 and HD uh, and oligo central oligomerization domain OVD uh, rings has more defined uh, density and they are more continuous. So the one labeled in blue is the oligo uh, the, <clears throat> the helicus domain and the one in the green is uh, OVD domain. Now, when we did closer inspection of this uh, map, uh, there are eight, I mean, we see eight subunits of OBD and uh, it forms a double octameric ring. And we see a density mismatch, uh, a symmetry mismatch uh, with, uh, of HD1 and uh, OBD. There are seven subunits of uh, HD1 as compared to the eight subunit of uh, OBD. And then there is, uh, we see uh, in the double octameric ring, we see some unaccounted density between the OBD interface. And these are the, the molecules, and these are the atoms which are uh, molecules which are involved in the OBD OBD interface and the, the DNA binding domain, uh, uh, the DNA binding loop uh, of uh, alpha uh, and the alpha helix D is interacting with the neighboring uh, alpha C, B, and C. Uh, so we did uh, the crystal structure for RAP68 and single stranded DNA, and we find there are four. Uh, OBD in asymmetric uh, four molecule of uh, OBD in asymmetry and which are bridges by two DNA, two single stranded DNA. When uh, we did uh, analyze this crystal lattice, we found there are uh, this are same arrangement as it's arranged in the cryo, cryo map uh, density. 
and there again uh, uh, OBD forms a double octameric ring and uh, which are rich by uh, the single stranded DNA. So the unaccounted density in cryomap is the bridging DNA, uh, single stranded DNA. Now, helicase ring, as I said, it's uh, there were seven uh, subunit of uh, helis, uh, helical domain, and it is divided into uh, of a two-tier ring, with the lower ring uh, is made from a uh, oligomerization domain, uh, while the top ring is made with the seven loosely or discontinuous uh, unit of uh, triple uh, triple A plus helicase. And uh, the cryo density map uh, accounts for additional density at the end terminal of alpha uh, alpha helis one, which is uh, which is uh, the additional four to six amino acid of the linker region. <laughs> and then we see some additional density, which uh, as you can see here, some additional density in the uh, OD domain of uh, this ring structure, which accounts for the DNA. But surprisingly, this uh, was not, uh, this density was not uh, present near the P, uh, near the pre-sensor uh, one uh, helix, but uh, it was more towards the, uh, the OD, the oligomerization domain. So from crystal structure, we know that uh, there are some uh, positively charged amino acid present at uh, these positions uh, like uh, arginine 260 and K264. But because the density, uh, the map uh, density is weak to put any, uh, to find any side chain, uh, we just assume that this, uh, this uh, amino acid are contributing for uh, this electro uh, this electropositive uh, surface, and to uh, to check that we muted this to uh, we muted this to amino acid to alanine, and carry out the infectious particle uh, the ABS infectious particle assay, and uh, both mutation at R two sixty and K two sixty four abolish the uh, the production of infectious particle which means this play a very crucial role in the AV life cycle. But when we did a helicase assay uh, for the mutant, uh, we found that uh, this has a low activity as compared to wild type, which means uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, both these amino acids are uh, not involved in the helical helicase activity. So now what we learned so far from the structure is helicase domain is very dynamic and OBD has a dimeric interface which forms octamer and this octamer rings are assembled in a head-to-head -head manner through single stranded bridge, uh, DNA bridging. So next we uh, want to learn what's the effect of ATP uh, when we add ATP, how this uh, is, uh, what's gonna happen to this structure. As uh, hel um, uh, RAP has helicase domain, which utilize ATP for its function. So in, uh, we tried it with uh, different uh, single stranded substrates uh, with, uh, where it's a DT25, uh, in the in complex with RAP68. Again, uh, with DT25 in presence of ATP gamma S, we see a double uh, funnel ring uh, like a structure, which has weaker density as compared to the APO form. But more interestingly, we see that this uh, helical domain is more dynamic and uh, has uh, open, close, or a ring structure where the rings are divided into two halves of four and three. Uh, 
we did it with a uh, single standard AVS one. And again, uh, to in contrast with uh, APO, we see uh, the density, but there is no density for the OBD domain uh, in this case. That means the OBD in this case is highly mobile. And again, we see uh, some open close and uh, the ring structure where again, the OBDs, uh, the helical domain are divided into rings of four and three. And uh, we see some deformation of DNA at the, the or lower tier or the uh, oligomeration domain. So there is a conformational change upon ATP bindings as compared to the other SF3, uh, uh, other SF3 members. AV rep, uh, the AV rep goes uh, a rigid body uh, con conformational change of 44 degrees compared to uh, ASV40, uh, which is 12.8 uh, degree and in case of PV it's even less. So as you can see this from this movie, it goes the health and the ATP and the triple health ATP plus they goes uh, they goes a conformational change around uh, and move toward the center of the core. So uh, when uh, we did uh, when in presence of ATP, we find some classes which are hexameric, uh, uh, and we studied that uh, in case of uh, AVS one, we haven't had enough particle uh, in the hexameric group, but so we continued with the D twenty five, and uh, <clears throat> sorry. And again, uh, there's the unit means they follow the hexameric uh, ring structure like other SF3, uh, SF3 uh, members, but they don't have the proper six fold uh, symmetry and they have much more uh, open and close conformation. And the electron density map is extended further uh, in the linker region. And uh, this act, uh, which act as a latch. Uh, to catch the neighboring uh, molecule, uh, the neighboring subunit. And we identified that uh, this uh, could be the docking of uh, this, uh, alpha, uh, docking of W2, they made a hydrophobic pocket between the crevice in alpha two, alpha three, and uh, uh, the, uh, of the neighboring molecule with uh, alpha one. Test that we muted uh, the amino acid residue at position 216, and we made a double mutant 215 and 216. And we see there is a complete uh, abolish of, uh, abolishment of uh, the oligomerization property of uh, this double mutant. So, with this, we concluded that. OBDs, they are highly mobile and binding of uh, ATP uh, leads to a rigid body change of uh, the triple A plus domain by 44 degree. And this conformational change is eight, four to eight times larger than the other SF3 helicases. And this uh, by, upon binding uh, it induces um, the ring closure and uh, there is a potential uh, DNA deformation, and it leads to uh, it leads the helical domain to form both haptomer and hexamer. So next, uh, we wanted to study the assembly and assembly process and the NMI thing because uh, it's uh, reps bind with different uh, DNA sites and uh, and the melting of uh, the ITR is, is comparatively easier than the, the site in the AVS and the uh, chromosome 19. 
So we wanted to catch different kind of complexes formed during uh, this processes, like what kind of complexes are forming, and we want to study them, and we want to catch at different positions. So we, uh, we continue our study with double standard DNA. And the major problem here with double standard DNA as we have 68 in solution form uh, oligomers and the size of oligomer, sorry. So we've earlier shown the OBD uh, binds to the, uh, the RBS site here, and there are three OBDs which bind there. And we propose that the how it works is first OBD bind to RBS, and then there is assembly of uh, helical domain, uh, and that makes a heptamer and loaded on the DNA. And uh, we seen that on, upon binding with DNA, this uh, forms a heptamer. So our main problem with the sample preparation was oligo the rep 68 oligomers elute same as in complex with double stranded DNA. As you can see here, uh, this, this is the size exclusion profile of, uh, and blue is uh, rep 68 alone. And uh, in red, it's rep 68 in complex with double stranded DNA. So, uh, so even in, if uh, when we made the grids, we find there are a lot of empty particles, just rep 68 oligomers without DNA. So to fix this, we uh, made RAP68 complex, then we did a gel filtration, then we cross-link and pass it through an ion exchange column uh, to get rid of most of the RAP68 uh, oligomers, and then again uh, did gel filtration. And in our experience, we found that if we do uh, glue discharge in presence of amylamine, we get a better uh, we get better grades. So this data again for double stranded AVS complex was collected at NCCAT. And after uh, the 2D class and ab initio, uh, we found three classes. And as you can see, uh, they are still very dynamic, it's like highly dynamic. Uh, and uh, we don't see much density when this is, we don't see much density here for some particles. So we continue with this class where we see uh, the two to three OBD domain and the haptomeric helicus domain, and we process further with the, the entry line for 3D classes. And we find we found different classes where we see there is, uh, in some there is, three uh, OBD, uh, in some cases we see more than three OBD, in some cases we see uh, up to six OBDs. So that means it's, uh, there are three OBDs which are uh, bound to the DNA and then there is uh, in and out, the coming in and coming out of other OBDs and that is changing the the helical domain also, this, they are making it's like very dynamic, as you can see here. So, so we, uh, means we have this uh, model, which I means there are three, uh, we can fit the OB, three OBD domain nicely, and then we see the additional density for, for other OBD. And as we said, there could be possibility that the other OBD are loosely bound and they are, uh, means it's just the OBD-OBD in interaction and they are coming in and coming out from the complex. So next we uh, try to study the RAP68 ITR structure then, uh, and this is the work which is right now in progress. We collected some data and we are still processing that. So uh, the ITR, uh, as I said, is a hairpin structure and it has the RBE element uh, at the, in the hairpin. So this data was collected at PNCC. And uh, as you can see from the 2D classes, we see six, uh, 
six uh, HD, uh, subunit of HD, and then there is a partial or uh, uh, seventh one. But the nice thing is like we see this, uh, the RB element, this um, hairpin stuff. And uh, if I mean, so you can see here that there is nicely six uh, subunits, and then this one is more discontinuous or weak uh, fragmented density for the seventh uh, helical domain. And the important part is one of the OBD domain is making contact with the RBE element, RBE prime element. So you can see here. So uh, we proposed a mechanism of about the assembly and DNA melting that uh, the RAP68 is present in uh, equilibrium in solution in monomeric state and higher oligomeric state. Upon binding uh, to the double-stranded uh, AVS1 or ITR site, uh, it recognized the, uh, the RBS uh, through OBD, which gives the uh, directionality of uh, the reaction, and then more uh, more of uh, the rep molecules they come and assembles, and they uh, make a haptomer structure. And upon uh, uh, with interaction means when we add ATP in the reaction, there is uh, a deformation of uh, DNA, which leads to the melting of DNA, and uh, that leads to kicking out of uh, one of the one of the uh, mon mon monomeric unit, and it leads to make of a hexameric. Uh, this leads to DNA melting and uh, transition of heptamer to hexamer. So as uh, if you um, this, we can compare with uh, the wave swinger. So, if you look at the top tier, is the uh, the triple uh, triple A plus uh, domain, and the bottom ring is uh, oligomerization domain. And this is more like uh, OBD domain. And when this complex translocates on the DNA. Some of the OVD, they come in and come out, and uh, three OVD make continuous contact with uh, the DNA, but the uh, rest of them, they're coming in and out, and uh, it leads to the, uh, as the, the, uh, the whole uh, RAP68 oligomer translocate over the DNA, it bands the DNA uh, and result in melting of DNA. And, uh, that, that leads to the transition from hexamer to heptamer to hexamer. So we can conclude with uh, our results so far that uh, large rep uh, induces DNA distortion during translocation and leading to its melting. And heptameric rings uh, are easy to load on double stranded uh, DNA as compared to hexameric ring where it's, it's the the channel is too small to accommodate uh, a double-stranded DNA, but uh, it's accommodate single-stranded DNA. This uh, uh, DNA uh, this deformation leads to DNA melting, and, and that subsequently results in transition from haptomeric ring to hexameric ring. And HD uh, oligomerization is very dynamic in nature, and it may be necessary for the multifunctionality of protein because they are involved in multiple DNA transactions. So we believe that this uh, different uh, oligomerization species are necessary for uh, the proper function of that protein in different DNA transactions. And in the end, I uh, would like to thank Carlos uh, to give me an opportunity to work in his lab and, and the former member, Vishaka. She did all the single-stranded uh, single complex studies uh, and other student in the lab, Molly. Uh, she was an exchange student from UK. She worked, uh, she helped with the, uh, 
the replication as uh, the AVA uh, replication assays and uh, Fike and Francisco did previous studies with uh, Fike was involved with the crystal structure of F68 OBD and Francisco was the one who started earlier of uh, this uh, work and did most of the AUC experiment and we would like to thank Kelly from University of Virginia where we did our grid preparation and initially screening of the grids and of, uh, of course the uh, NCCAT and PNCC without whom help we were not able to get all this structure at this uh, resolution and uh, and solve solve this problems. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Raul. That was really fantastic. We have a couple of questions, and mm -hmm. again, um, please feel free to send in questions as we as we go along. Um, we're monitoring the Q and A. Um, so a question that came in um, specifically about cross-linking techniques that I also had, as you were saying, it is what what did you actually use for cross-linking for your? Um... Uh, so for uh, rep sixty eight uh, for cross-linking, we used glutaraldehyde at uh, uh, this was a point zero five percent. And was that you? Did you just do that simply in solution, or or were you using any of these? So the way we make, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so the way yeah. we make our complex is first uh, we do uh, the dilutions. We take diluted rap sixty eight because, as I said, at higher concentration it tends to form, uh, form oligomers. So first we dilute our protein and make uh, then add. Uh, uh, the DNA and then uh, concentrate it back. And uh, after first pass of uh, the uh, from the size exclusion, that time we add a uh, cross linker. And uh, after quenching the reaction, then we pass it through the Q column or anion exchanger. Thank you. Uh, there's also a question about whether there are uh, helicase inhibitors available, and if so, would they stabilize your structure in a in a useful way? I'm not sure about uh, if they will stabilize the rap 68 structure because uh, uh, this. Uh, well, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not aware about uh, any of this helicus inhibitor. In, so frankly, I don't know where, if it will stabilize this structure. All right. Um, can you define the DNA oligos? Um, so I'm guessing like, can, uh, can you tell where the deformations occur or is this non-sequence specific? So uh, for single stranded, uh, the double octameric ring, we use DT25. So that was a 25 base pair of uh, uh, time in, uh, 25 base pair time in DT, uh, which, uh, which is help us to capture this double octameric ring. Now, we don't know the biological sig significance of this double octameric ring, uh, but, uh, uh, if you look into the AV genome, this uh, stretch of three to four uh, uh, T thymines are present. It comes, uh, three uh, stretch of three thymines comes like 50 times. So we are assuming that there is some significant role and this, uh, maybe this double octameric ring formation happens only in the lab condition or we don't know if it happens in the natural and physiological condition too. Uh, for uh, the uh, AVS1, single stranded AVS1, that was more site specific. Uh, so that's uh, the uh, AVS1 site from the uh, chromosome 19, where the integration site. And actually, uh, I I'm. Think that was the question. I'm curious, in your maps, how many um, nucleotides do you actually see of your 
of your oligo? Like, do you uh, see okay. them all? <laughs> so, yeah, we, uh, so if I can. So as uh, once, uh, we had, uh, once for all the work, we used different uh, length of DNA. So uh, in case of uh, rap, uh, single standard, I uh, think we see all, uh, means we seen all 25 nucleotides. And uh, then for double standard DNA, we use, uh, different length of DNA and in one case we use 40, one base pair. And in our recent work, which we are still uh, in process, we are uh, doing using 50 base pairs. So when we use the 41 base pair, we find that that's not enough so to we increase the length of uh, the DNA to 50 base pair. Uh, we are still uh, haven't collected data for the 50 base pair DNA. All right, and two uh, reagents. There's another question about um, magnesium, and I'm um, the the question is: Were there experiments conducted in the presence of magnesium ions, and did magnesium have an effect on oligomerization? Uh, so when we did. Uh, the apple structure, there was no magnesium ion, but when we add the ATP or ATP gamma S, uh, so again, uh, the grids were made uh, in a way, we uh, make the complex and just before uh, uh, freezing the grids, we add ATP, uh, ATP gamma S, and there's uh, means we add magnesium and ATP gamma S at that point. So uh, all the, the complexes with ATP gamma is they had magnesium ion, but apo structure doesn't have magnesium. Awesome. And there's another question, but I'm actually going to pop in with one of my own since I can. Um, so you showed um, and uh, early on an OBD uh, structure that you solved using X-ray crystallography that you then compared to the uh, structure you had from cryo EM, and I'm wondering mm -hmm. how the con it, were those similar constructs or were those constructs very different? Uh, so the, that was the RAP68 uh, was the similar construct. Uh, it's just the the DNA which was used in this case was a uh, protein base pair is uh, ABS one site uh, as compared to the. Okay, but the actual protein construct was the, protein was was the same. same. Okay, yeah. that's really cool. Um, all right, so there's a question about um, whether your reconstructions were tried with symmetry imposed. And I feel like given what you've shown us, that's a fairly complicated question. Um, so maybe you can just talk about if and how you've used symmetry to look at your data. Uh, so when I mean, we had uh, the C1 symmetry imposed and we did all this, but I mean, mostly as I said, like the most of the uh, single standard work was done by Vishaka. And uh, I, I'm not sure like, how that part was done. Uh, I think right now we are, as the double standard and ITR, uh, we are, as I said, like we are still processing the data. So we are, uh, means we just got this model recently. So uh, I, can't, uh, I can't say what was done with uh, the Apple double uh, Octomer or work. So you, you basically always use C1? Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't see any new questions in the Q&A. If people have any follow-ups on things we've been talking about, if any of our panelists have other questions. 
Uh, hi, this is Mike. Uh, just to, to follow up on that question, it's a very interesting uh, situation. You might have symmetry mismatch here that you have yes. sometimes seven, sometimes six. And uh, in fact, the same part might have seven in one place and three in another. Um, mm -hmm. how, did, how did you sort that all out? Did they, uh, did, is, the, um, is the symmetry mismatch so um, uh, regular that it always uh, pops in as the seven in this orientation and the three uh, extra ones uh, it, it just follow always in the same place? Or, I mean, if, there, if there's flexibility there, uh, you could have the seven aligned properly and the three just come completely are disordered because uh, they, they occupy different uh, places. So you're talking about the idea? Yeah, it's especially when you have like um, seven in one place, which is a very strong signal, and then three in the other place, which, uh, which might not be uh, aligned as well to the seven. So, so uh, there, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, yeah, so like that, for, for instance, that one, yeah. Mm. Um, so the, as I said, uh, this uh, the seven is uh, that's the uh, there is only three OBD in this case, and the seven one is helicases. It's not like there are means there are seven OBD at one and seven helicase at one time and three helicase at another time. This uh, in this case means like this is uh, the helicase domain which comes to some, and we've seen this symmetry mismatch in the double octameric also that there are eight uh, double octameric eight OBDs uh, and uh, uh, seven helicase. So helicase we always seen either it's haptomer uh, in absence in absence of ATP and in presence of ATP C we mix up uh, hexamer and haptomer. On the other hand, for uh, OBD, we've seen uh, high mobility in case of APO structure, we've seen 16 OBD. In case of uh, uh, single stranded DT, we still see, uh, within presence of ATV, we still see 16 OBD. But in presence of uh, single stranded AVS DNA, we just seen, uh, uh, we, we haven't seen any OBD. So uh, it's it's normal. It's like there are uh, we always seen uh, when, when in case of uh, ITR we are always seeing three OBD, and then there are more OBD which are coming in or out. If I get it right for you, they're, co they're, co they're covalently attached, but they're yeah. But uh, we I mean, it's like I think it's like this three OBD they are making uh, the contact with DNA. Uh, and the other OBDs, they are just coming in, uh, in and out, making contact with uh, the OBD itself, right, and rather than making direct contact with DNA. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, unless there are any last burning questions, uh, we will wrap up since we are at the hour. All right, thank you very much, Raul. That's really exciting. Um, Thanks so, a lot. So much data that looks like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. All right, and um, again, we'll we'll be here at the same time, the last uh, Thursday of um, May. The registration link is available at cryoemcenters.org, and we'll be sending out other announcements. Um, and we hope you join us again.